Okay, welcome to the Sumer Sports Legal Tampering Show. I'm Eric Eager. I'm one of the VPs at Sumer Sports. I'm joined by the CEO of Sumer Sports, Thomas Dimitrov. Thomas, the 13-year GM of the Atlanta Falcons. The I'm trying to do the math in my head really fast. The eight, the seven-year director of college scouting for the New England Patriots, two-time Super Bowl champion of the New England Patriots there, has been in this seat before. This is this is a trying time for the team builders in the NFL. And we've seen a flurry of activity today. None of it final, of course, because we are uh basically on the uh we are basically on the um you know just the legal tampering period. We have to wait till Wednesday until the league year officially opens and all these deals can be finalized. Uh Thomas, wow. This has been a crazy day, and I know we've had a lot of work at Sumer. We had to we've had to do a lot of product meetings and everything like that, kind of keeping one eye on the TV and the and the Twitter, and one eye on what we're, we're really being paid to do. Um, but this has been a crazy day. Yeah, it's crazy, and I also think about the numbers we're talking about. Right? Let's talk about before we get rolling. I mean, twenty five million dollars over what was expected, basically, right uh, on the salary cap. When I think, uh, what are we talking about now? 50? I think it's 250 now, right? I think we're right around 250. 255, yep. 255. Um, I heard our buddy Mike Lombardi um, riffing today or yesterday on, you know, the um, the teams and who had what over the cap and or under and how much money there was out there. Net net was there was a lot of money to be spent, right? And back in the day when we were here, when I think about myself even 10 years ago, you know, we were tiptoeing around things at times, and this is just an amazing situation to watch what's going to be happening in free agency, which is a great lead into where we're going to be talking today. But look, I'm excited to watch it. I'm excited to watch the young guys out there, young general managers, how they navigate through that. That's not always easy, right? When you don't have 10, 12 years experience under your belt. Yeah, Beat Gamer, one of our great uh, followers, he said, is it, and we're going to talk about Chris Jones first. So this is pertinent. He says, isn't KC kind of locked up? from participating in free agency because of the Sneed tr tag and trade. In addition to the Jones contract, he also says it's $10 million more than expected. It's actually a little bit more than that. It's about $13 million more than what everybody projected. It's $30, uh, it's 30 million more than last year. But you always bake into these projections, whether you look at over the cap or our internals at Sumer or even team internals, you always look at like a, a basic increase in the cap and everybody was surprised that it was about 255 as opposed to about 242 was what everybody was kind of projecting. So every team got about 13 million more than they were expecting. And so a lot of teams were able to do some more with what they were than what they were expecting. And I think one of those teams is the defending Super Bowl champion twice over Kansas City Chiefs. They bellied up to the bar on Saturday night. And signed Chris Jones, uh, you know, multiple time. You know, he's won three Super Bowls for them. He was their franchise tag player in 2020. Uh, he held out the first game of the season this year uh, in a contract dispute. It rarely happens this way, Thomas, but they were able to come to an agreement after he came back to the team and played this season out. A five year deal worth 95 million guaranteed, basically, over the first three years. There's that little like third year, which only becomes guaranteed in the basically the second year. So there's that rolling because the chiefs kind of are not one of those teams that's willing to kind of guarantee everything up front, but it's effectively a three year, $95 million guarantee contract. And then it's about 158 or so million over the course of the whole deal. Uh, it, they're paying him Aaron Donald money. And this is a team Thomas that has been very stringent. They let Tyree, they moved on from Tyree kill. They Kelsey's been, the one other guy besides Mahomes that they've paid a lot of money that they've drafted, but tight end is a relatively inexpensive position, and then they have Mahomes. They very much are following your prescription that you talked about in the show, which is a team is built on a few pillars, and then it's your job as a general manager, whether you know Brett Veach in this particular case, to build the scaffolding around those pillared players. Chris Jones is, has proven himself to be that player for this team. Let's be retrospective here for a minute. Do you remember a year ago? Was it a year ago where you took a little heat out there because we started talking about, you know, maybe it is time and maybe Chris goes somewhere else. Let's let's fold into that for a half a minute. Only back then, what was your thought versus now as you assess that? Because 
bring people up to date quickly on yeah. that. Your was I, what? I, yeah, I thought at the time, I mean, I thought at the time, so prior to last season, Chris Jones had never played more than two, or, sorry, 854 snaps in his career. So when you think about, you know, Defensive linemen don't play every snap, as you know. They rotate in and out. But Chris had been, even though he's their best defensive player, had always been a guy that rotated a little bit. And then in 2022, he played 1,100 snaps. So he played 300 snaps more than he had ever played. And he had had a humongous season. If you look at any sort of metric, he had an outlier year. And so from a team builder perspective, Thomas, right, your job is to buy low and sell high. And so my thought process was, if you've had a guy that's been this his whole career, and then all of a sudden you get this, you could probably sell him for high. And that was always, so you could get a high pick for him. You know, he's he's nearing 30 years old. You need to rebuild the defense. You know, he wasn't accepting any of their offers last summer. So evident, like that was my whole thesis on trading him. And obviously, you know, he comes back after one game off the Chiefs are the second best defense in the NFL in points per game. The offense for the Chiefs was down, you know, not not as good. They they basically leaned on the defense this year and won a Super Bowl. And so I was wrong. Like I they very much leaned on him and now he's even more important I think to this team than he was when I was talking about trading him. Now, he's still a year older yep. and the league still is the way it is, but things have changed a little bit, right? Well, I think it's a it's a perfect example of yes, let's look at the data, right? Let's look at it as as a as a helper, as a um back to the, the augmentation idea, right? As Sumer, let's provide them with all the data that you have and let's 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 factor in the subjective real side of the locker room effect, the coaching effect, you know, the 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 amount of of um impact that he's had on the team. And remember. You you obviously know this. I mean, we talk about this all the time. It's a one part of data that we really can't nail down as far as the work ethic, the passion, the following, the leadership ability, whether it's you know real or not, or whether it's whether it's by example. I mean, these are tough decisions to make as a general manager. Everyone understand that you can't just look at the data and say, ah, this isn't worth it. Back to pillar positions, right? You need your pillar guys firmly embedded. And as a GM like like Brett Veach, who is continuing to kick butt, is the best out there right now, hands down. You, you can't argue that. I don't care if he has Andy Reid where he is. And Brett, if you're out there, uh, I love your staff and I love your owner and all that, but I really believe they need to laud you a lot more publicly. So we're going to do our job in doing that. This is a I good think, move. I think he's him. the most underrated person on the, in the Chiefs organization for a couple of reasons, right? And, and it's finally coming out. Everybody used to... And, Look, no NFL owner is cheap, right? But the Kansas City Chiefs don't spend as much money as most NFL teams. And he deals with those restrictions. He deals with uh, the, the restrictions of having. This was a the first NFL team in history to have a quarterback who's making the most money from a salary cap hit perspective make the Super Bowl, let alone win it. And then, of course, the year before, they were the first team in NFL history to win the Super Bowl with a quarterback making more than 14%. He has done a phenomenal job. And I think from the point, and, and it was really funny, I had somebody in the organization uh, a couple of years ago when I was talking, because we were doing a bunch of work on weak link systems, right? And I always looked at the weak link system from the perspective of the third cornerback or the third linebacker or the nickel guy, right? Like all those. And he's like, Eric, part of it, part of the weak link system is your is your pillar players. If Chris Jones, so ESPN had this stat, Chris Jones was double teamed on 72% of pass plays last year. So you think about it from a weak link system, Thomas, that means that George Karloftis or Derek Nottie or Felix Anazuke Uzama, their first round pick this year, or Charles Amenahu, a guy they picked up for a relatively inexpensive deal. All of those guys have easier matchups because Chris Jones is taking the harder matchups and winning them, right? Part of the weak link system thing is when your strong players can take the hardest matchups possible and win those, and then your weaker players can play better. If your best players can make the weaker players better just by osmosis, then of course they're worth more. And I think that that's the part of like this whole deal that not only was I necessarily not right on, I actually think to, to kind of bail myself out here, 
Chris Jones has gotten better at this. He hasn't always been this good of a player, I think. I think he's gotten better as a player. And as you've seen in your career, like Richard Seymour, uh, you know, uh, Calais Campbell, who plays over here in Atlanta, there, when, there are really good interior defensive linemen who get better into their 30s, and maybe Chris Jones is just one of those players. I agree with you on Chris Jones. I think it's it's a big time move that 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 warrants big time lotting for Brett Veach and company there. And this is worth tweeting out. Sumer Sports, Thomas Dimitrov, and Eric Eager categorically state that at this point in the National Football League, Brett Veach is the best general manager out there. And there's no there's no discussion about it. Well, it's because of this quarterback. It's because of this owner. It's because of this head coach. The reality is those men are some of the best at what they do, and so is he. And right now he deserves he deserves the lauding of being the best. He does. And and part of this is market inefficiency. And and that kind of gets me to my next player who the, it, it, it matters for the Chiefs, but in two ways. Um, Christian Wilkins, who was the 13th overall pick in the 2019 draft by the Miami Dolphins, the first year under Brian Flores, the the first year or first year under Chris Greer, I believe, when they were rebuilding, right? And he was that pillar position player for them. And I want to talk to you about a couple things here because he hit the open market today, um, in large part because the Dolphins were almost too successful in rebuilding. They were they 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 rebuilt it from the ground up. They got they were successful right away. They got Mike McDaniel in there. They got Tyree Kill in there. They got Bradley Chubb in there. They got Jalen Ramsey in there, and. They, they built fast, but the problem with that is by the time they got here, there was no money left for Christian Wilkins, right? And some and, and this is a, a lesson for the Chicago Bears. This is a lesson for the Arizona Cardinals and our friend Monty Austin Fort with 13 draft picks this year. You have to be careful sometimes about how you rebuild because you have to have that proper balance of veteran guys and draft picks because sometimes you get to the the musical chairs part and there's no chair left for a guy who's a pillar player. And so he goes to Vegas on a four year deal worth 110 million. And this is part of the Chris Jones discussion because Chris Jones is in that building every day. Everybody loves him. He has the championship pedigree, three rings, right? Four Super Bowl appearances. And you're saying, okay, sure. You can trade Chris Jones and move on. But the alternative is having to pay a guy like Christian Wilkins who's not quite as good and also isn't part of your culture yet, right? And you've brought in free agents who have been good elsewhere that maybe didn't fit in in Atlanta before. And it's almost just as much money, right? And so that's like the part where, you know, Wilkins is a fantastic player. He's going to go to Vegas. He's going to get to play with Max Crosby. But that had to play into the mind of Brett Beach, which is to say, if we give up on Chris Jones, Justin Matabike doesn't even make it to free agency Christian Wilkins does, and he's making twenty-seven and a half million right out the gate. So why don't we just pay up and pay the extra couple million a year for Chris Jones, a guy we already know, and 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 move on with our lives? Look, some of these decisions on defensive linemen, DNs, rushers, legit interior guys that can run rough shot over people, they are really complicated decisions to make for your general manager and your head coach and your organization. Right, a lot of money goes into it, and you run the risk as we all do, when we start talking about free agency, that we haven't talked a whole bunch about it here. It is one of the elements of building your team that is, is quite honestly, many of the people in the NFL who talk to me about Sumer Sports and third party help is like, look, I can figure out the draft, Thomas. We're fine there. Help us in free agency because it's pretty tough to predict. Unless you really know someone, it's pretty tough. And even then it's tough to predict is that person going to rise to the occasion or did they rise? Is that their high point, high water mark, And then they just dive down. Look, I've been on both sides. Remember we did it with, with um, Vic Beasley. Michael Turner. Michael. Well, yeah, but I'm talking about D D D line for a second here, right? Pa- okay. Pass rushing D line. It's tough because we all need them. And we all, we all say, look, if we can get someone who is legitimate enough and we know them, let's keep them. Or if, and if, and the problem is, and I remember this with, with Vic Beasley, he led the sack, he led the league in sacks when we got to the Super Bowl in 16. And everyone was saying, oh, he's so up and down. Don't do it. Don't do it. And I went round and round and round on it, on it, Eric, because 
if he left and he went somewhere and he and he reverted to what he did in 16, you're the biggest dumbass around, right? And yes. you have to kind of weigh, you have to weigh it. You have to decide on what is the best thing to do. And, and that's not easy. Of course, it's very complicated. So that the Dolphins let him go, you know, that's a big deal for them. L you know, letting someone like that go, that's a complicated deal. A, a top 15 pick, a pillar of your a pillar of your team. That team is brought in, like I said, Ramsey, yeah. Teron Armstead, Tyreek Hill, you know, Raheem Mostert's a big player on that team. Like guys that, you know, it's hard to build through free agency from a culture standpoint. You want to draft and develop guys, and it's really hard when when that happens. Um, you know, and and to your point, it's 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 tough. And I, I I get why people are asking you about that, right? Because the draft is one dimensional, right? You already know in the draft how much the players are going to cost because there's a there's a cost curve, right? Mm -hmm. You know how much the first pick is going to cost. And so it's all about player evaluation, whether or not the player is going to be good for you. In free agency, you have to determine how much he's going to cost. And then you have to determine fit, right? You've always talked about, and we're going to move off a different position here, but you've always talked about Dante Robinson, who was a nickel in Houston, right? Played inside, and you signed him to play inside, an increasingly important position for you in Atlanta. And because of injuries to Brent Grimes and things like that, he had to play outside. And all of a sudden, it's not a fit. And now you look like you have egg on your face when in reality, you bought a, a you, you bought a different car for the roads that you were driving on and, and it didn't end up working out. And, and so that can be hard. And that's why free, free agency is multiple dimensions. It's how does he fit in my scheme versus, you know, the data in some ways is simpler, but you have to translate it. You have some certainty, but you have less certainty in other ways. And then you have the cost curve, which can be incredibly hard. So let me just, before we move on to the next topic on it, all of this free agency work for the, for the builders, for the GM mainly and his staff, they're working diligently on it while the team is still putting everything together, right. And playing the final games of the season, the personnel staff is working, you know, uh, directly and focused on what is there. They present just so everyone knows what they do after the season's over. Normally um, staffs for the most part, will go to their position groupings and the, the GM and his personnel staff will give the coach, the coordinator, the defensive coordinator, and the position coach a list of players to look at that they're really interested in, right? And they can determine at that point, are we going to spend big money on a D lineman? Are we going to have a mid -liner? Are we going to have an old guy? And the old and in the way, that's a discussion all the time, right? Do we want an old and in the way guy? Do we want a guy who's still thriving? That totally for everyone on the, on the uh, listening day is totally contingent on for the smart guys, the smart builders, what the draft is like. Because if you really believe there's a deep draft in a certain position and you know it's a good value, that's the best place to go and get it. You know there are certain players out there in certain positions that are good value in free agency. We've talked a little bit about it before we move on. Tight ends, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. there's there's a spot there in a tight end spot i think where you can grab someone in free agency at a good at a at a good price tag of course oh for there's sure other like Hayden, Hayden Hurst right. Hayden Hurst is a guy that's provided yes. value for you know the Bengals at times and obviously you know uh Jared Cook has provided value for playoff teams and you know and and none of these guys are considered all that great right but it's not even about like that's all the value. The value in football is signing players that other people look at and like, Ugh, and then they end up being valuable for you. And that and and it's what's funny is as we're starting to see some of those values go away a little bit. Like Robert Hunt is John getting twenty million a year as a guard center kind of a player. So some of those yeah. those values are starting to shrink up in some of those places in free agency. And some of that is because the cap went up, and some of these teams don't know what to do with the money. Um, and some of that is because, uh, you know, they've seen this and they've overreacted to it uh, in free agency, which, again, that is incumbent upon the smart team builders to zig when other teams are now zagging. Um, OK, Kirk Cousins, right? The big, the prize. You know, we talk about Baker Mayfield. We're not going to talk about Baker Mayfield much, but he signed back with Tampa Bay. So the big the big quarterback in free agency is Kirk Cousins. And he, from all indications, is going to sign with the, our hometown, Atlanta Falcons here, four years, $180 million, 90 million of it is guaranteed. That kind of makes sense that it's 
Like if I told you we were at dinner at the Super Bowl and I was like, ah, what about two years, 90 million? Felt like a lot. Mm-hmm. If it's kind of like that, I don't actually see the, the 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 sticker price being all that tough. But Kirk is coming off an Achilles. He's 36 years old. So this contract, if he plays mm-hmm. it out, is going to be out to 40. I mean, you you drafted Matt Ryan, who's a much better player than Cousins. By the time Matt got into those ages, it didn't look as pretty as when he you initially drafted him, right? And so... Definitely. I think that, you know, this is a team in Atlanta that's got some talent, right? Bijan Robinson, Kyle Pitts, Drake London, a good offensive line, defense that has some playmakers. I think that this can help them become what Arthur Blank probably wants, which is a playoff team. Can it help them become a contender in the Super Bowl? Because that has always been the problem with Kirk Cousins is that Kirk can get you kind of he can get you on the outside of the dance, but can he get you onto the dance floor? I I just really have a hard time. Like, that's a good question. I thought Kirk has played some good football the last few years, but it's all about goals here. So first of all, I am really happy that Raheem Morris and Terry Fontenot are going at this. I think getting this organization to a spot where they start winning consistently is, is really important. I think Having a guy like Kirk Cousins, love the kid, right? We love his his toughness and his aggressiveness yep. and his comp- you know, competitiveness. I really like the player when he's operating in, in the groove. I'm a bit concerned about his health and how he's going to monitor and, and, and work through that. But hopefully they have that figured out and they know how they want to approach it and everything. Okay, you you go into this, in my mind, with an owner that's going to be supportive of you going in after a big time move like this. Personally, I, I have to think a lot more about the, you know, the eighth overall pick, right? I know there's a lot of talk out there about pass rush or getting Dallas Turner or getting Jared verse. I'm telling you, I'm still, I'm still focused on getting that young quarterback to work behind Kirk cousins for the next two years and and have a little bit of a la Green Bay Packer that a lot of people don't do. Keep building. They have a nice defense right now. I know they need more pass rush. I get it. But I love that idea if they if they would think about doing that. Now, that means in my mind, personally, you know me, trade up Thomas. I would be I wouldn't be just focused on Bo Nix. Not that I don't I think Bo Nix has his ability. We can talk about that another time. We didn't talk about it with with the Raiders. Right. There's a nice spot there. But I really, really do believe, man, that would be a really cool thing to see them really go after that quarterback position and maybe have a legit shot at Jaden Daniels. I I know it's a big move, but let's talk about being all in, right? We decided to go with high energetic, high optimism, smart defensive guy like Raheem. Let's go in there and get him a nice quarterback situation to build off of. Yeah, and I think Cousins at this juncture in his career, like, you know, early in his career in Minnesota, him and Mike Zimmer didn't get along very well. And I think that Zimmer did a lot. And Mike's Mike's a great coach. I mean, when you look at his record in Minnesota, and and he can coach defense, it was very clear that he wasn't a fan of the Cousins type of quarterback. He always preferred the Teddy Bridgewater kind of Jim McMahon type of quarterback. And so I never felt that, like, he – embraced cousins and so there was always the thought in minnesota that cousins would never mentor another quarterback and yet i think with o'connell o'connell brought out the best in cousins as a person you could see in the documentary and everything i think raheem is similar raheem and then zach robinson my former colleague at pff who's the offensive coordinator there i think that there's some I, I do think that they're like, look, Kirk, Kirk, you're going to make 90 million more dollars. You've already been, you're in the hall of fame of earning in the NFL. Uh, we're going to draft a quarterback. You're going to be the starter for the next two years. We've seen this formula work in green Bay with Jordan love. You're not going to be benched, you know, be financially for the next two years Buy into this. You'll be, you, you're going to be a, a legend in Atlanta. If you win, if you, you know, if you win it over the next few years mm-hmm. and, and make, because I agree with you, like I, I think that Jordan Love has given some of these teams, and this is a relative skills competition, the NFL. Yes. If right. you That's draft J.J. McCarthy or Jaden Daniels or some one of those great, that means the Vikings can't. 
That means the Saints can't. That means one of these teams you're competing with in the NFC to win three years from now can't draft that quarterback. And then next year, yeah. when you want to, when you're when Kirk Cousins plays his first year, now you're now you need a quarterback to back him up. You won't have a guy, and the, and the Vikings will have JJ McCarthy for one year playing with Justin Jefferson. You're gonna be like, God damn it, I wish I had. You know, I wish I had developed this player for a year. And that's because I think about Minnesota, the team that Kirk just left, right? And we we like Quasey a lot. He's very smart. He's done a lot of – I actually think Jonathan Grenard was a great signing by him today. But, like, the Vikings are the fourth best team in that division now, in large part because they said Kirk Cousins and no one else behind him is good enough. And the Packers drafted Jordan Love and sat him for two years, three years – and Jordan Love pops up and becomes a great quarterback out of nowhere. Not and great is a you know of superlative, but Jordan Love comes out of nowhere and performs admirably for half a season. And now you're like, well, Christ, I don't know. Like, where did this come from? It's like, well, because a team thought ahead of time. And could you, as the Falcons, think ahead of time and le- and and not only are you better at quarterback than every other team in your division now. Well, how about you be better than every team at quarterback in your division two years from now when Kirk retires? And what is vital, if you are a thought-out team, you better believe as a GM, Terry Fontenot better be up all up in his staff's stuff to, to find out where are we, not only next year's quarterbacks, but two years down the road. They better be dialed in on this, on this layer of quarterbacks coming out in the next couple of years to help them determine what they're doing beyond just the the signing of Kirk Cousins, right? If you don't see the next three years a strong layer of quarterbacks, you better be very smart about how you approach this year where there are legit fives and maybe even beyond. So it's, it's a really important thing. And by the way, I'm asking for forgiveness because, you know, mama and papa, uh, Eric Eagers out there, they heard you use the Lord's name in vain, which I know oh, you sorry. didn't mean, and I know that hurts the sh- your soul on it. So um, we'll just. I make thought sure you were that- going to apologize because I'm usually the one that's on my phone and like and I've retweeting all this stuff on the show, and you've been on, and so I. No, but people but, are on. Uh, they're, they're texting me like crazy. Like it's I'm getting more and more stuff, but I don't want to break news here. That's not my. That's not. My oh, point. okay. Got it. Got it. Well, yeah, this has been good. I I do think. To your point, this is a relative skills competition, the NFL. And so if you're the Falcons, I Dallas Turner, a really good prospect. You know, we're going to talk about uh, linemen on, by the way, the Sumer Sports yep. 2024 draft show on Sirius XM. We had a great debut on last Friday. We're going to be this Friday. We're going to be talking about offensive linemen. We're going to have former NFL offensive linemen and co-author of mine, Jeff Schwartz, on the show this Friday. So be prepared right. for that. Um, but we were talking about last week, uh, you know, wide receivers and everything like that. It is a relative skills competition. So if you, if you hang on to somebody now, other people can't have them. Right. And so when we talk about like the Vegas Raiders, if you know, Vegas Raiders need a quarterback, the Denver Broncos need a quarterback, the Vikings need a quarterback now without cousins. If you go and snag the fourth best guy in that group, you are not only are you helping yourself, but you are screwing over the other teams in the league, which matters quite a bit. And again, I like Dallas Turner. I like Jared Verse. Latu Latu is a good player. I don't know if he's necessarily in that range of eight yep. for the Falcons. They'd be more of a trade back guy. But uh, but as you know, you know, you know this specifically as a GM. If you draft the right quarterback, a lot of the a lot of other stuff kind of falls into place. And if the Falcons have two good quarterbacks, then then a lot of stuff. Would would also uh, you know they they can almost you know eclipse a lot of people uh, you know sort of in their realm. We only have about ten minutes left. We're going to talk lastly about a running back, Saquon Barkley, the second overall pick in the 2018 draft by Dave Gettleman, the New York Giants, uh, one of the favorite players of one of our founders, Jack Jones. He goes to the Philadelphia Eagles, who have made big splashes today. Bryce Huff, the edge player from the New York Jets. 20% pressure rate, quite a good player. Can he play full-time? Good question. He might not have to play full-time with the Eagles because they have so many good uh, defensive linemen. Uh, Landon Dickerson, getting $87 million from them to play guard. Good guard market this year. But the one that's going to make the most headlines is the fact that they signed a running back. Uh, they lost DeAndre Swift. Swift got 
uh, a contract to go play for the Bears. So they bring in Saquon Barkley to come in and be their bell cow running back, about $12.5 million a year for him for over three years. Barkley finally gets the big contract that he's been looking for since being drafted. I, I, I mean, if he can stay healthy behind that offensive line, I think it's going to be pretty scary, Thomas. It is. Leave it to leave it to Howie just to jump on in there and turn it upside down in that division, right? I'm, I just, um, it's, it's. I think it's a, it's a major kudos to him. You know how I feel about Howie and his abilities. Very interesting to see. I mean, how many more years do you think he has? Not, not Howie. Saquon. <laughs> yes, you guys last a lot longer than running backs do. Um, I think that. Uh, I mean, I hope that they. I hope there's always the impetus to want to use it, overuse a guy when you sign him. Like I always thought the Cowboys could have used Tony Pollard more, but because they gave Zeke the $90 million deal, they had the incentive to overuse, you know, I think they, if they use Barkley like 200 carries a year, 50 catches a year, and just kind of make sure that he's healthy. I think he'll be incredibly effective and he'll play out that contract because he's, He's been the two years of his career, 2018, his rookie year, and 2022, the year that he took the Giants to the playoffs. It's been awesome. It's the injuries, right? And we we know how to prevent running back injuries to an extent. It's it's usage. Uh, and and so if they make sure that they spell him with another back, whether it be through the draft or whether it be through another free agent signing, like Aaron Jones just got released today by the by the Packers. Uh, because Josh Jacobs signed with the Packers, uh, you know, some other guy that can come in and spell him. I think if they go in and they're like, look, we just signed this guy to a huge deal. We're going to give him 300 carries to justify this deal. I think he's going to last a year and a half. Unfortunately, that's, that's like kind of my issue. What do you think? Yeah. I look, I'm so mesmerized by the amount of running backs that are available in this class. Right. I'm, um, I, by the way, what, what was the final APY and the guaranteed money off of say, so yeah, Barkley right? got 26 million guaranteed, three years, 37.75, so 12.58 million. So 26 million guaranteed, um, so about nine million per year guaranteed. Okay, yeah, I just I'm thinking about that, and, and my head is all over that, right? I mean, back to value and where you're going, and you know where how he was with that approach and why versus you know draft, which a draft class. I'm I'm not sure where this draft class is, quite honestly. But obviously, when you play against a guy and you know his strengths in and out the way you do, it's a lot easier to pull him in and understand how important that that person can be. You know, given the fact that he was a major opponent of yours. Well, the, yeah, in the draft class, we'll talk about running backs at some point on our on our Sirius XM show. There really isn't a running back that's projected to go much higher than top of round three like there's not a Jameer Gibbs there's not a Bajan Robinson there's really not even I mean you're talking about third round guys uh this year and so you've seen you know Josh Jacobs get a deal you've seen DeAndre Swift you've seen uh Barkley kind of at least and the money's not that big like we're not seeing guys get up to 16 million like like uh, McCaffrey or or Kamara but we are seeing guys at least put their foot in the ground and get money. Tony Pollard signed with Tennessee today. Uh, hopefully he'll get a part-time role with Tajay Spears there, the former Tulane running back, as opposed to being the bell cow back where he kind of struggled last year. That, uh, again, I think that the running back dollar figure has kind of equilibrated, but the demand for them is still somewhat there. And and, and I think that because there's high-end guys, you're not seeing, like Derrick Henry still in the free agent market. Um, Aaron Jones now with his release. Uh, guys like Alexander Madison, who I think are a little bit further down the list, uh, are still available. But to your point, it's a pretty healthy market uh, now. Uh, yeah. So we uh, talked about – go ahead, Thomas. We, I was going to say we revisited this. I was at, at the Combine, and I was sitting at dinner with Michael Silver, who precipitated uh, an article and a lot of discussion about Devontae Freeman. When we were on our bus on the to the Wednesday practice at the Super Bowl, and Devontae Freeman hits the world and said he's, you know, he's holding out if he doesn't get a contract – it was crazy. My point is I bring that back up, and I think of my experiences with some really good running backs. Michael Turner, um, we, we talked about him a lot, right? Yeah. A guy like Devontae Freeman, who was very good in his earlier years and then really tailed off, you just really never know how that's going to play out, right? 
in the end, could I, if I could have had it back, would I have signed him for what we signed him for? No. Uh, but he did some good things for us. So that's, that's the way you approach it. Well, and, and I think Freeman's illustrative of, of the, and even Turner, although Turner was a bell cow for you, but Turner was not a bell cow for San Diego before. So he had tread on his tires. You had Jarius Norwood, who's kind of a good change of pace back with him. And then, you know, Freeman had his best years when you had Tevin Coleman as his change of pace back. And it just shows how running back kind of is like a lot of these guys can't live on the page by themselves. They need a great, yeah, it was sort of a joke, but I always said, you know, Miles Sanders got a big deal after pay, playing his contract year with the Eagles. DeAndre Swift got a deal playing his contract year with the Eagles. Sometimes you just want to go to the Eagles and run behind that offensive line. It, it's oftentimes with these running backs, it's all about where you play. Um, and that and that kind of diminishes their value to an extent. And obviously going and playing for you guys in Atlanta with Matt Ryan and Julio and, and Roddy kind of taking – the top off the defense a little bit would certainly be good for any running back. We're almost, we're out of time. This has been fun, Thomas. Uh, I always love chopping up league news with you. Like I said, Friday, seven o'clock on Sirius XM, myself, Thomas will have a guest. Jeff Schwartz will try to have a guest every single week from here on out. Some of Thomas's friends throughout the league, you'll get to uh, hear from current and former uh, NFL executives, as well as myself and, and Thomas Dimitrov. So uh, this has been great. Thank you all for coming. This has been a, a, a really a uh, fun time. So for Thomas Dimitrov, for Eric Eager, this has been the Sumer Sports Show.